Hello, and welcome to the League of Education Voters 2020 virtual event on racial equity in education. I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and your MC. We're so glad you took time to join us today. This event features closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen. As we get started, I would like to introduce Eric Holzapfel, our new Director of Field and Community Engagement. Eric will provide instructions on how to access Spanish interpretation of today's event. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you um, and join the League of Education voters um, here in a little bit um, when Eric enables my interpretation function. Um, I'll start giving instructions in Spanish on um, how to start it, but um, there will be an icon at the bottom of your screen um, for interpretation and I'll explain that in Spanish. All right. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. Thank you for being here today and supporting our shared vision that every student in Washington has access to an excellent public education that provides an equal opportunity for success. We would like to acknowledge our corporate and foundation sponsors. Please help me thank the following partners. Boeing, Pemco Insurance, College Success Foundation, Quinault Indian Nation, Alaska Airlines, College Spark Washington, Columbia Bank, Community Minded Enterprises, Kaiser Permanente of Washington, Parkview Early Learning Center, and the Suquamish Tribe. To begin today's event, I would like to introduce Fawn Sharp, current president of the Quinault Indian Nation in Tahola, Washington. Ms. Sharp has held numerous leadership positions, including an appointment by Governor Gary Locke to serve as trustee for Grays Harbor College, governor of the Washington State Bar Association, trustee of the Washington State Bar Association Indian Law Section, vice president and founding member for the National Intertribal Tax Alliance, and director secretary of the Quinault Indian Nation Enterprises Board. Fawn has conducted lectures and publications all over the United States. Fawn, thank you so much for sponsoring our event and for joining us today. Good morning. I uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to welcome everyone in our Coast Salish language. And on behalf of Coast Salish peoples throughout our region, uh, we are very happy to participate in this and, and welcome everyone to this virtual world. Uh, and this is an encouraging time. Uh, there's no question we are facing an apocalyptic challenge, multiple apocalyptic challenges in this very moment. And there's no question that we were destined for this time, we are prepared for this time, and we're ready for this time. And I think not only as adults and leaders within our state are we prepared to meet the challenges, we are committed, uh, tribal nations are committed to emerge from uh, this crisis uh, stronger and more resilient. And I think a key part of that is ensuring that those children in our state who are watching us every day, those children who have a lot of questions in their minds, those children who are going to grow up up as adults and in their childhood as a very impressionable time, we have an opportunity to really mold uh, the future. And I often say we are the ancestors of future generations. When you think about seven generations from now, when they look back at the year 2020, uh, there's just a, a tremendous opportunity in front of us. So I, I encourage people uh, to not succumb to the, the apathy, the, the fear, the uncertainty, but to embrace this as a very sacred moment in time in which leaders can come together to truly shape a better future for our children, uh, and in particular through education. So my hands are raised to each and every one of you for participating today. Uh, best wishes for a successful event, and we are always happy to, to stand in strong support uh, for all the work that you do. See you well. Thank you, Fawn. And now we will hear from our CEO, Lori Hennessy, who joined the league just about a year ago. Lori has 30 years of experience working in nonprofits, government, and communications. Her passion is around kids and equity, and she volunteers on a variety of boards in the Puget Sound area. She is the mother of three wonderful grown kids 
and has been active in her community of Vashon Island for 20 years. Please welcome Lori Hennessy. Hi, thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori. If you're like me, um, you may be tired. It's been a long year between COVID-19, missing our friends and family, what's going on in politics, much more. It's been a long year. But today, we're not here to talk about fatigue. We're here to talk about an opportunity. Right now, in our lifetimes, to finally make a difference in fighting racism. Racism in our communities, racism in our government, racism in our school system. Now, I know that some of you have been working very long, very, very hard on this. Many of you live it every day. But right now, we see a historic spark. We have a once-in-a-lifetime passion around fighting racism. And this makes us very powerful. We've not seen this kind of energy for a very long time. So the question is, how do we make the moment last? You're about to hear from Dr. Ben Danielson. Now, not to put too much pressure on him, but I bet he's gonna make you think. It may not be comfortable, it may push you, but isn't that what we all really need right now when we talk about racism, to be uncomfortable, to be pushed? Here at LEV, we promise to you that we will seek uncomfortable places. We will push for difficult dialogue. We will look at ourselves internally and seek community partners who need our advocacy. We'll find ways to work alongside you and we will not be satisfied until we truly do reinvent education. Now we can't do it alone. Please reach out to us, volunteer, join our board, learn the issues, advocate in Olympia, donate to our mission. The opportunities are endless. And speaking of opportunities, I wanna take this one really quickly to thank some people. First and foremost, Dr. Ben Danielson for generously giving his time and wisdom and spending his life in service to others. Our sponsors who have generously supported this event, our hardworking volunteer board for helping again and again push this organization forward, not to mention hiring me a year ago, our staff at League of Education Voters who worked incredibly hard and they care very deeply about kids every day. But most of all, you, the people who have been there at our schools, working to make things better, asking tough questions, pushing school boards, demanding change, and improving education for all kids. So with that, we're glad to give you this opportunity to explore the critical conversation of our time. Listen to Dr. Ben and then explore in breakout groups how you can make a difference to truly bring racial equity to education. Together, we will explore that critical question. How do we make this time last? And now I'd like to introduce a very special video. A few questions to ask first before we begin. Why do we do educational advocacy? What drives us? What are we really about? And those answers can come to us from Youth in Focus, a fantastic organization that we have worked with to present the true experts in education, students. Let's check in with them. Thanks again. How are the children? How are the children? Because if the children are well, that means the foundation of our community is well. That means our growth is going to be at an all-time high. We're going to be really well if our children are well. I would say yes. I do actually, because I feel like whenever we try to pitch any ideas or any changes that we want to see implemented, it's really hard to see it. They don't care about certain people's opinions or just thoughts. Um, I had an experience with that before. Somebody lighter had the same idea I had. They didn't listen to me, but they listened to the lighter person and took the idea and used it. I just feel like certain people, they just don't care and they just don't want to listen to them. I feel like we're just trapped inside this um, endless line, just marching forward, just keep on doing the same thing with nothing ever changing, with the occurrence of just something stopping, and then it just keeps on rebooting itself. I believe that I would like to be heard, but I don't feel like there is a way for me to be heard. I feel like school ignore the kids who need the more help, the most help, or ignore the kids that 
that just are going through a little struggling and stuff and they just ignore them, push them to the side and that's just not fair. I think that right now, the thing that I, the thing that I would want to have school feel like a place where I belong is to, the only way I can think of to phrase is to not talk so much and to act more. I think I really need like my teacher's support. I would need my differences, my my being a person of color or um, people who are LGBT or any of that, I would need that to be recognized and acknowledged. I need people who understand what it's like to be not to be ignored and just because of my racial background. Being more lenient on like different rules for different students would be like something that could help with inequities. Some students come from different backgrounds and they have different problems going on with their lives so they really can't like do everything the way the school has set up. I would just want them to listen to try to understand what we go through as either native, minorities, colored people, black people. I would just want them to try to understand and listen. And I feel like if they understand and listen, they would change a lot, honestly. I tell them to understand that school is for kids and it's for the betterment of students. And it needs to be not only for our education, but for community. Thank you again to Youth in Focus for grounding us in what our work is about, putting students first. Now I want you to meet someone very special who personifies true excellence in her field. Brooke Brown has taught English and Ethnic Studies at Washington High School in Tacoma for 14 years. As a powerful voice for equity in her building and in the Franklin Pierce School District, she leads equity trainings, co-leads the school's equity team, serves on the district's equity team, and represents student voice on the school's foundation team, which focuses on addressing the racial opportunity gap by advocating for restorative justice practices and equitable discipline procedures. Brooke believes that learning is best done in community. She works to center student experiences and reminds them how much she learns from them too. She advocates for educating the whole child often using content to teach life lessons and challenge her students to look for ways to improve their communities. Brooke worked tirelessly to bring ethnic studies to her school and her district and serves on the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction's Ethnic Studies Advisory Committee, where she works with a small group of stakeholders to create the framework for the state to adopt ethnic studies implementation statewide. Please welcome 2021 Washington State Teacher of the Year, Brooke Brown. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm uh, just humbled and grateful to be here. Um, so growing up, I knew that I wanted to make the world a better place. My career prospects varied from Power Ranger to President to Civil Rights Attorney, and I eventually landed on being a teacher. And teachers are superheroes. As cliche as it might sound, they do make all the difference in students' lives. So much of what I remember about school is how my teacher made me feel about myself, about the content, and about life. And we're living in a really unique time right now. In addition to being a teacher, I'm the mother of four. This pandemic has changed the way we do life. Teaching remotely is hard. Add on to that, helping a high schooler, a middle schooler, and an elementary schooler learn at home, it's hard. We also have a two month old, that's hard. COVID and the closure has hit each of my children in different ways and comes out differently on different days. One day, my eight-year-old, who is very hardworking, completely fell apart in distance learning. She couldn't stop crying. She was inconsolable, and that's not her usual, dis her usual demeanor. None of my mom tricks were working. 
I'm not above bribery. Nothing was helping her calm down. She was trying to work out a math problem. And I'm an English teacher. I don't know how to do the new math. I wasn't explaining it the way her teacher did. I was able to connect with her teacher and set up a video call. Her demeanor and mood changed immediately as soon as she saw her teacher's face and heard her teacher's voice. It was better than the chocolate croissant. That's what usually works. She listened patiently, figured out how to solve the problem, and her mood was lifted for the rest of the day and really the rest of the month. Our teachers matter. The first thing her teacher said to her was not about math. She connected with her on a human level to ask her how she was doing. She cared and she demonstrated that over and over again as she adapted to technology and continued to show up daily for my daughter and all the other students in her class. In her class. Uh, shout out to Ms. Moore. I see how much you care about your students. You're making a difference each day by how you show up. And during closure last year, I read an article that helped me to name what our students, what we were all going through and what we're continuing to go through, grief. I teach 12th graders who I walked alongside as they had their plans for spring sports, prom and graduation canceled. They were crushed, saddened. Showing up each day, sharing space with them helped me to grieve, creating space for them to reflect and share how they felt was important. And at the forefront of the time we spent together online. I have a 12th grader who is navigating grief and loss this year. Everything she has looked forward to is different. Will there be a soccer season? She's been capped in the last two years. Will there be assemblies? She's the vice president of the student body. What will prom and graduation look like? Will she be in the spring musical? Shrek was canceled last spring. She misses her friends and teachers just as I miss my students and colleagues. An amazing colleague of mine, Violetta, shared a quote that resonates so strongly with me. If it feels heavy, that just means you're not supposed to carry it alone. What does that mean in this season to share the load, to help one another carry it? What does this look like? This is something I'm trying to instill in my students each day and my children at home. How can you serve one another? First, how can you take care of yourself? What does self love look like in the time of COVID? Taking breaks from the computer, making time to exercise and move your body, feed your mind things that make you happy, spending time with loved ones, being intentional to look for joy, all of the above are true. So the message I have for teachers and students is now's the time. COVID-19 and the pandemic have blown wide, blown wide open the structural inequalities that exist in our communities. And we have the chance to think of something new, something better. This is a chance for our profession to work together to give our students the best. Teachers as a whole are an incredibly committed and hardworking bunch. We're no strangers to long hours, grading and planning on the weekends and showing up for extracurricular activities for our students. We're often a sympathetic ear to what students and fellow teachers are going through, a mentor to help them explore new ideas and a learning partner who celebrates with them as they master skills and techniques. However, we must confront the fact that the educational opportunities have not been equal for all of our students. They haven't been and that won't change until we start to dream and commit to a new way of doing things. My goal is to help guide that necessary work and channel the care and leadership of educators to focus that work on the best practice of, practices of today regarding equity and opportunity. We will do this by prioritizing and centering our marginalized students, which will benefit all of our students. Teaching the whole child and centering their social emotional needs helps them be ready, more ready to learn. Centering restorative justice and healing in our schools instead of focusing solely on punishment. We need to increase the training and teacher preparation programs and mandating ongoing trainings in equity and diversity, offering opportunities for students to learn about mirrors and windows, mirrors to learn about themselves and windows to see and relate to one another. Classes like ethnic studies and African-American studies are so important for us to historicize where we are today, help students to learn about themselves and one another and have empathy and compassion for one another. Also, we need to rethink the accountability process in schools where we center the needs of our students and communities in, a, in the evaluation process. This requires us to rethink how we show up, be willing to let go of the ways we've always done things, increase in our humility and a willingness to keep working to get better, to get it right. Now is the time to include the many stakeholders, especially those who have been left out, to use the opportunities and resources of now to build the next phase of education together. We have the chance to take a hard look in the mirror and ask ourselves some challenging questions. Is this working? I mean, really working for everyone? 
And if the answer is no, then we owe it to our grandchildren, to the generations that come after us to do our best to imagine and make a more just world, to ask our students and families how we can improve, to not be satisfied with the status quo of, well, most kids are doing okay, to be willing to share seats at the table and listen, really listen to what our students and families need, to what our teachers need. We can use a pedagogy of love in the classroom that helps our students honor their past, love themselves and work with each other to make that new, more just world a reality. They need us to keep showing up and do the inside work to lead the way. I have faith that we can. Thank you. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Benjamin Danielson. Dr. Benjamin Danielson is the Senior Medical Director for the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic. He has worked there for 20 years, combining patient care, clinic leadership, and community advocacy. Dr. Danielson is a clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington, where he received his medical degree in 1992 after completing undergraduate studies at Harvard University. He completed his pediatric residency at Seattle Children's Hospital, where he continues to be an attending physician. In early life, he was rescued from the foster system by a single mom who instilled in him and his sisters the value of education and community service. Dr. Danielson also serves on various boards of health-related organizations, philanthropic organizations, and community groups dedicated to health issues. He chairs the Governor's Interagency Council on Health Disparities, co-chairs the Governor's Task Force on Creating an Office of Equity, chairs the Group Health Foundation Board, is a board member on King County's Children and Youth Advisory Board, and has been on King County's Board of Health. The unifying thread in Dr. Danielson's activities relates to promoting well-being and dignity, especially for communities who have been pushed aside. He has found opportunities within and outside of systems to advocate in partnership with groups and individuals who are dedicated and passionate about creating a better world. He realizes he is the least useful member of the circles he joins, and he is inspired every day by the children, families, communities, and organization with whom he interacts. I'm still digesting all of the pieces of this meeting that have already happened. And um, I'm just um, some reverie, some sense of awe and warmth. And I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, thank you for this invitation, that very unnecessarily kind introduction, uh, Brooke. And thank you for what you shared. Um, I will acknowledge right away that was the true keynote for this uh, day and this conversation. Um, I'm, I love being asked to be in groups that are um, in partnership and, and yet not the everyday folks that I get to see in my day-to-day -day work, uh, especially when it comes to connecting with uh, the education system. I'm a true believer in that adage that um, was said by a Surgeon General long ago that you can't educate an unhealthy child and you can't keep an uneducated child healthy. And that means our work is intertwined, is together. Our successes and our failures are absolutely shared. When we don't do what we should be doing for youth in the healthcare system, uh, then we're not uh, allowing you to do what you need to do in the education system and vice versa. Um, so we're in this together. And I think that's an important message, uh, something that I hope young people see, that it's not linear the way they're supported. There's not one space where, um, where they're embraced and loved. These words of uh, belonging that came up already today are so resonant for me because I think that in many ways, maybe the future best measure, measure of that future educational system that I start to hear little inklings of, uh, maybe it should be measured by the sense of belonging that people can have. And maybe right now, the feeling of grief, which is so real and so powerful, uh, calls even more importantly on a sense of belonging. Belonging is how you get through grief. Belonging is how you see something on the other side of all of that. Belonging is what it's all about. And I'm rambling because uh, I'm just in this sense of reverie from this time. You espouse some of the values that uh, I also believe in so strongly uh, that sometimes life is not hard. Um, it feels hard. But when it comes to being with other people, sometimes life uh, boils down to basic things. 
the triad of show up, listen up, and step up is uh, kind of the feeling that I, I hear expressed in the conversation so far today. I want to take you and pull you back from educational system for a few minutes, talk about experiences um, that I might be familiar with, and create some more context, some that you're all very familiar with, and some that might be um, different ways of saying things that you've seen and heard before. And then we'll pull you back into these conversations at the end of my bit, into the healthcare, into the education system again, and uh, continue this conversation. This is really meant to be sparking, and then your voices, your thoughts, your ideas, being uh, the actual energy that drives what we talk about. I'm gonna open up my uh, PowerPoint and steal your screen for a second. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what does this moment mean to us? What should we be interpreting from this time that we're in? How do we clear our heads in the fog and the stress and start to think about what what it would mean for this to be important generations from now. And I think about the way I consider what it means to be well and unwell, and it's so easy to get lost in this uh, iceberg of, of so many things, the many things that kind of determine wellness. And I will tell you, not a single one of those uh, uh, titles or issues was ever taught during my uh, medical school education or residency. And I wonder how much of that is part of your training as well, because these are the things that really determine wellness when I think about young people. I think about these times that we're in and the many different ways that our heads are clouded and, and stressed by the issues that are facing us right in the moment, the existential things that weigh on our minds, our caring for the people around us, and the many different pieces of information that kind of swirl at us and through us as we try to navigate what is a really interesting and challenging and, um, oh, I wish, I could remember what our opening was around sacred, this sacred time that we're all in. When I start to boil down the factors in the world, in our society that really determine wellness um, for young people, for everyone, I start to think about these circles, these intersecting, overlapping, vend in many ways, however you wanna say it, circles that impact what it means to be well right now. We have these issues and they are overlapping for sure, but they are also so distinctly different that if you thought that you were solving one issue by addressing another circle, you could be sorely mistaken. You cannot necessarily address an economic alienation issue by addressing only a toxic stress issue. Economic alienation, what I mean there is, is that we have a system in this, of, in this country that really creates huge gaps between the rich and the poor that creates incredible differences in privilege. And it's not just that the poor are suffering from that system because they are poor, but they're also suffering because of the gaps. There is so much evidence now that says that it's not just um, where you are economically, but it's how much gaps there are between rich and poor around you that determine your health. And for just about every measure of well being, educational opportunity, and otherwise, the greater the gap between the rich and the poor, the worse off everybody is, even the rich in scenarios like that. And that's what we see in this country. This toxic stress circle is really about the things that you and I know a lot about, issues like ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and how those stack up in our lives and create greater risk for uh, illnesses and lifelong health challenges, not written in stone, but surely uh, imperatively implying what your risks are. And they overlap those two overlap with this issue of racism and oppression, and I wanna talk a little bit about that with you. This is not an issue that came with COVID or is any, in any way new. This goes back to the roots of what we are, who we are as a nation before we were a nation. We just have to understand, even if um, presidents don't want you to know this or share this with the young people around you, this is the truth of our nation that we are built on the backs of the enslaved people who were brought here from Africa and on the land that was taken from the people who were here before us. Those two facts are irrefutable and they create the possibility for the wealth that's experienced in this country, but it is also the wound that has been unrecognized, unaddressed, and so has unhealed for generations, hundreds of years. I think about the spaces that we live in and how they're created 
And I know that where I work in the central district was one de was once demarcated by these red lines, these red zones that said, this is where you can live if you're black. This is where you can't live if you're black. And they're not just red lines. These maps say that it is hazardous to be in these zones. It is hazardous, perhaps hazardous for white people, perhaps hazardous uh, for the environment or the infrastructure. That statement of hazard is such a powerful and judgmental and judged kind of component that it really drives the way we think about, um, about space and place and separation. And, and now hundreds of years later, it drives um, so many of our health outcomes What's interesting to me and beautiful is that out of those red lined zones uh, has grown incredibly beautiful, amazing, um, worship worthy art, strong music, empowering communities uh, of, uh, in this case, black folk who just made community happen. I'm here in a clinic, the Odessa Brown Clinic, that is uh, here because black women said, this is what the families in our community need in order to be healthy and healthy enough in order to learn. These factors have been part of our history and the stories that have come through that are stories of strength and power. And for all of the other images of, of protest and strength and power that you are seeing right now, I hope we understand that these are recursive, that these are stories that have been told and seen before, and maybe never so powerfully as through the through the education system, never so powerfully, powerfully as through the eyes of a young child braving solely to walk through thresholds where they're unwelcome, where belonging is not assured, where a sense of uh, space and place is not promised. And being there anyway, because it is, it is the protest, it is the act, it is the personal thing that might change the world. I wonder for us how many times there might be opportunities for each of us as individuals to be in a moment that might be very, very personal, very individual, maybe feeling all alone. And yet in those moments are things that people will never ever forget. Our strengths that are much stronger than the bigger people around us. Our acts that are more courageous than any other opportunity we'll have in our lives. And I think about how that plays out and how it's part of the storyline of who we are as a country. The same acts of protest and strength that are welling up in this moment around racism are the acts of protest and strength and the images of strength that we've seen in young people for uh, time in memoriam. The strength of the young people as a pediatrician for me is the strength that I see that is needs, needs to guide us in these moments that we're experiencing. Outside in this world is language that is seen and heard and used without much veil to uh, create the red lines that we saw in those images from 100 years ago. It does not take much imagination to read this tweet and see that we are talking about, I am protecting you white suburban people from these inner city black people. That this is a uh, drawing the lines of uh, racial violence and inciting the kind of violence that is dividing our country and encouraging greater division. And if you don't think, I, I, as teachers, I think you all know this, the young people in our lives know this, are seeing this, are experiencing this. There is possibly some ways to help sh shield and protect, but there is a lot more understood and known and maybe this is a moment for living with eyes wide open rather than trying to protect from what is a strong reality in the world around us because it matters. It matters so much. When we think about what risk we take in communities of color and black indigenous and communities of color for everything all the way down to the miracle of childbirth in this country today it makes us want to rise to a different level of action to know that this is not just about socioeconomics, to know that that circle of, of economic alienation is not the only story, but racism is another story in this. To know that if you're a black woman in this country and you are pregnant and you've completed college and graduate education, maybe you're the first lady of a former president, maybe you're the best tennis player in the world, in the history of the world, your risk of dying in childbirth is still higher than a white woman who never finished high school, who didn't have any economic benefit. This is the land, this is the life, this is the world that we live in today. It is irrefutable, it is a tragedy, it is a travesty. It's an injustice that we now have the opportunity to stand up to. These issues are real because they cost lives. 
so many lives throughout our time, but so many lives in these past years, especially lives like Brianna Taylor and Charlena Lyles and Malaysia Booker, lives that have been taken by police gunfire in, the, in moments and have stacked up in our lives and in our experiences. I want to know that today, our ability to respond to this reality is different, is stronger, is more potent, is more powerful than the injustice that is occurring around us. And we have to see these names, know these experiences, understand this injustice, and be ready to respond in any way that our lives tell us. And that can be a beautiful, beautiful act of power. That can be a moment that shifts the world, that shifts people in their boots, that creates the opportunity for a dialogue about something different, a chance to dream differently, to uh, erase the sense of hostility and violence and create a sense of uh, unity and growth by addressing the very issues that have been the deepest wounds in our society for a long time. And I wanna warn you all and say, this is not the kind of thing that one moment, one solution, one goofy person like me saying, I have the answer will ever address. This is not about easy solutions. Just this example about working with courthouses and knowing that when judges purposefully tell jurors not to let bias influence their decision, they are actually more likely to let bias influence their decision. And what I mean by that is there are no easy, quick, one fix answers in this situation. We have to lift ourselves up to a deeper, more complex, more difficult, more confounding, more challenging set of solutions than we've ever thought about before because this is where we are today. And I wanna warn you, I want to warn you that when you start seeing lots of commercials that talk about social justice, you should be very worried. Because once we start having the uh, teach the world to sing Coca-Cola commercials re replete in our social lives, once we see the ad world take over the social justice message, I will tell you that is when we see the end of social voices rising up and we turn this into a commercialized moment. So please beware of short shrifting this moment of symbologizing it without creating true action that turns into real change that builds revolutions of different possibilities for education and for the lives of youth around us. I wanna tell you that individual acts matter. And I wanna to talk to you about the idea that perhaps um, targeted universalism is something that can really make a difference in the lives of so many more. Targeted universalism is that example where you cut out a curb on a corner and it, for the sake of someone who's in a wheelchair. But what happens is that means someone who's pushing a stroller suddenly has an easier chance crossing the street. Someone who is elderly gets across the street more easily. Suddenly the jaywalking turns into crossing on a corner and there are less motor vehicle accidents. That act that focuses on one set of needs actually expands to be universally beneficial to everyone. I'm thinking about just selfishly what happened in the 60s in the central area where young people Young people from, young black people from the central area did sit-ins and protests around housing discrimination. And through that act, they started to change systems that not only benefited the black community, but benefited gender issues and gender identity issues and benefited so many different components of marginalized populations throughout the work. I will not pretend that it's over because you can still go to housing uh, resources today and find plenty of discrimination happening still. But these acts that focus on one community's needs and then expand to benefit the many other kinds of strategies that we need to be highlighting and expanding on. I come with here today because I want to talk about answers as well as challenges and problems. And one thing that we've really thought about and started to use in our clinic is this thing called the equity pause or the equity timeout. I'll tell you that I'm a blatant um, thief and I stole this from what happens in uh, operating rooms where in order to improve safety, uh, operating rooms now take a pause right before they start a surgery and they do a checklist to make sure they're doing the right things. They make sure it's the right patient, that they're operating on the right party part, that they have the right equipment, that they have the right support. That uh, operation room pause has led to better safety fewer uh, injuries in surgeries than any other intervention in the last 50 years. And I think there's a way to borrow that and bring that into our own lives around this issue of addressing racism and create our own equity pauses, our own equity timeouts and make sure that we're answering questions when we're making big decisions, making sure that our decisions are informed by questions like, are those who've been most impacted um, centered in the conversation around this solution? 
what are we assuming about the resources and capacities of those affected by this decision? I mean, if we're going to be making drive through COVID testing strategies as a community, um, are we assuming that everyone has a car and can drive? Or do we need to have different kinds of solutions and different other answers that address the issues of the communities that we, we say we care about so much? What might be the unintended consequences of taking this path? The equity pause, just that moment, has been so missing in so many of our decisions right now around the COVID pandemic and has been historically missing in so many of our organizational and community decisions about how to lift up the lives of those most negatively impacted by racism, oppression, and marginalization. And one more thing I want to say to you is that I think the future of diversity and representation in every layer of education, of leadership, of healthcare um, needs to be different than the, the, the experience that someone like me has had to go through. There has to be a difference. I, I, there cannot be another generation of people who have to change who they are in order to fit into systems. People who have to leave some part of their identity at the door and adopt another persona, another way of speaking, another language, another approach to things in order to be accepted in those groups. There has to be a way for the tables, the areas of leadership, the, the, the congregations of teachers to accept and create belonging for diverse teachers who bring their whole selves into those spaces, who do not have to code switch, who can be loud and not be worried about being seen as an angry black man, who can be um, emotional and emotive and not worry about being seen as somebody who is less logical or less intelligent. There has to be a changes that are so fundamental that we can bring our whole lives into the spaces that we say we care about changing and those whole lives will be accepted, will be welcomed, will be feeling a sense of belonging. This is incredibly important work. And when I think about Ruby walking out of that school by herself, showing such pride and strength and being so moved by that moment, I also don't want Ruby to continue to need to walk through the doors of school and not have a sense of belonging, require um, a guard, a rule, a set of policies in order to feel like it's even safe. We need to create these spaces, these spaces from the very schools that you work in. Uh, this is a school near to my home where this, um, this tradition of welcoming students, students of color, BIPOC students into the space of education by the community around them, elders saying, I see you, I look like you, I care about you, and I'm invested in your future. What is happening outside the schools, in the communities, the people in and outside of schools who are saying you belong here and we are gonna make sure that you have what you need to succeed. What I also see there is, is people who have paved the way now getting out of the way and creating spaces for our youngest, most powerful, most bright, most enthusiastic, most beautiful voices to express themselves and do what we need them to do, which is, which is lead us lead us into a different day, a different tomorrow, full of expectations that things are better, expectations that their voices will be heard, expectations, not just requests, but expectations and demands that they feel a sense of being listened to and belonging and that the future that they are sculpting is going to be the future that will be seen and appreciated by all of us. I thank you so much for letting me be part of your group today. and. Um, I really want to leave you with this question. What does today mean? What is it different about today that will lead us to a different kind of future tomorrow? What can we stand up to, rise up to, create, risk our own comfort for in order to make sure that tomorrow and the next tomorrows are different, are better, are as beautiful as our minds and our children tell us they can be? Well, thank you. I'm gonna stop rambling and allow you to move into the next part of this, but I so appreciate being invited to join um, this morning. And I think uh, the world of the efforts, you are superheroes. And um, as someone who gets to watch you do your magic, I just wanna know you to know that wherever you are and however you're doing it, um, there are people like me who just deeply appreciate you for what you really do for our youth and our future and ourselves. So thank you. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Danielson. Uh, that was amazing. Do you have time to take a couple of questions? 
Great, great. Excellent. So we've got about maybe five minutes or so. Uh, if there is a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Ben, feel free to use the Q&A function in the bottom of your screen. And uh, let's start with this one. Do you think Washington State can lead the change to update the adverse childhood experiences or ACEs questions to address the relevant environmental surroundings? I think it'd be really interesting to update a lot of uh, the way we think about that. Um, just to add on to that, I, I think um, we're going to be forced, and I hope that we embrace actually understanding environmental racism as also part of this conversation about the kinds of experiences that really inform a person's life. The two-way street be between uh, environmental justice and, uh, and racism is really important to acknowledge and understand. I think also, that um, what I've seen in the last years through the education system and other systems is um, a desire to understand strengths and abilities and assets, uh, to understand how communities create possibility, um, understand how uh, places that seem sometimes uh, dollars poor are actually uh, so potent and powerful that we need to measure those as well. I hope that we don't get in some straight line in our assessment of ACEs and adverse experiences because it does not tell the whole story and it does not predict the whole future. Um, there's a bigger and a broader set of uh, parameters that maybe we should be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Here's a question uh, from Nikki Lockwood, who's a, a director of the Spokane Schools uh, School Board. How do we get the white led groups, bosses, administrators to truly listen to the people of color they serve or the people of color that are working directly with the people most impacted? I think um, all of us should be thinking about ourselves as public servants. I think we should be promoting the idea that I'm a public servant, that you are a public servant, that our uh, school leaders are public servants. And what that means to me, that you are answerable and accountable to the communities around you. If we adopt that perspective, then we also adopt an opening, a transparency about who we are, our positions, our power and our privilege in a way that is responsive in a different manner to the communities around us. I think that's an opening. I think that any leader, especially any leader with great privilege should not have their position if they are not opening themselves up to learning more personally about their own biases, their own uh, inherent racism that we all carry, their own um, unrecognized ways in which they treat people differently, and without a commitment by school systems to make sure that the people at the very highest seats of power are truly representative in culture, in race, in ideology, in identity um, of the people that they serve uh, is a priority. And we cannot accept any more the onesie twosie approach to diversification because um, tables with one person who looks like me at it are never going to change. They're just gonna be actually creating more isolation. We have to commit ourselves to a different layer. This is a time where whatever the incremental idea that you had last week, last year was, has to be expanded and exploded and logarithmically increased in the scope of your demand, of your hope, of your dream. And we have to we have to vocalize it, we have to say it, we have to commit ourselves to being part of it, and we have to stick with it and say that we are not stepping aside, we're not gonna stop listening until, until the change that is enormous, that we hope for and demand is happening, rather than that, maybe next year it'll get a little bit better. Uh, we can't do that anymore. This moment, the lives lost, the pain experienced, the grief and suffering, the historic grief and the un healed wounds that we face today will not allow us to be incremental or uh, slow in our response to what is asked of us right now. I truly believe that. I'm not just spouting out. I, we have to rise up in a different way. This is might feel hard. We might feel tired. We might feel challenged in, in so many different aspects of our life. And this is about generations. This is about the deepest, purest, foundational component of who we say we are. And if we're not going to step into that right now, then it will never happen. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Ben. I have time for two more questions. First one is from a teacher. 
Dr. Danielson, as a white educator in a primarily white school, how do I reach out to students of color to provide support? I think that that is a, a different set of challenges that really also needs to be specifically talked about and created. And I, I don't, I'm not going to say anything new to this group because I know you're all very adept in these areas of creating spaces for allyship in these areas of creating dialogue to um, what, what may be different today is that there's actually an overt attack against um, creating a sense of understanding, maybe especially in white communities. There's an attack on, uh, on being willing to talk honestly about where we are in this time, what is happening around racism, what is happening around um, all of those spheres that are causing uh, problems in health and opportunity for young people. There are attacks on whether or not you should learn about enslavement, whether you should learn about the stealing of land. There are people who want you to just be proud of, of whatever storyline has been created around the story of this country. And that is an incredible existential threat to humanity in my view. So I think there's an especially strong obligation. Uh, I think a person who is a, a white, uh, was it male? Um, um, has a space and an opportunity to say things that other people might not have the opportunity to say. There's a relevance to um, a, a white community of children to hear a white uh, teacher say, this is the reality of our country. This is where we are. We all have an obligation to understand, learn about our own biases, learn about the systemic things that change opportunity for some people compared to others, and really be, um, be agents of change in that space. I do feel like everyone has a different kind of voice and each of us owe it to each other to find ways to access our particular voice, our particular position, and our particular opportunities with the young people around us. Great, thank you very much. And the last question that we have time for is, can you talk about early learning, the importance of access to early learning and childcare in fighting racial inequality? And are there any resources for childcare, especially early childcare educators who can embrace racial equity in their work? Hmm. I was sort of uh, intentionally using my my shorter, like my, my presentation time uh, to talk about the realm outside the education system because I, you know, a lot of the stuff I learn about around uh, anti-racism in education, I've learned from people who are on this call, on this uh, Zoom. Um, and I think you all know the, the truth uh, that if you are black in uh, early learning programs, you are three and a half times more likely to be suspended or disciplined for the very same behavior that uh, someone whose skin is white um, uh, also uh, displays. That the roots of uh, diversion from a path of, of acceptance and belonging and achievement in our educational system starts even before our educational system is formalized. Um, that the early learning spaces are so uh, so primal, so essential in the launch of a young person's sense of who they are relative to learning, what their potential is, and how they can um, enter the system with all the tools they need. So our focus and our uh, lifting up of people in the early education system is really critical for any level of success down the road after that. I'm saying the things that you all know and have taught me, so let me just uh, check myself on that. I do think that um, that maybe that's an especially important space for uh, BIPOC young children to see people who look like them supporting them. Maybe that's an important place to uh, maybe measure belonging um, for, at, from the earliest moments to really see if what we're doing makes sense and if uh, our, our creations are understood and honored and supportive of the young uh, minds that we are, we are working with. I'm really excited in our clinic that we're building, a new clinic, we're actually building it side by side with an early learning program to live through that uh, Jocelyn Elder statement about you can't educate an unhealthy child and you can't keep an uneducated child healthy. We're gonna um, gauge our own success as a clinic um, uh, in one way 
on school readiness. That will be one of our key performance indicators. And we'll measure that in the same way that schools measure school readiness. And we'll um, work from there to really advocate for schools that are also ready for diverse young people. Um, that that is definitely a two-way street and a, a bilateral bit of work. So I want to I want to be in that space. Maybe I've got teacher envy. I want to um, <laughs> want to be in that that circle and support that. And um, I want everybody to know that that your education and your health are so linked uh, that we understand that and honor it and support it, especially when it comes to addressing the issues of of uh, opportunities lost as a society. Great. Well, thank you again, Dr. Danielson, for such an amazing presentation. Can we share the slides that you showed? Because there's been a, a number of requests for that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I'll send that in the follow-up email. Okay. And feel free to stick around for the breakout sessions if you like, and that is coming up in just a minute. I would now like to introduce our League of Education Voters and League of Education Voters Foundation Board Chair. She has raised four children in the Bellevue school system and is the proud parent of a public school teacher. She's a former Microsoft executive and a current director at Groupit. Please welcome Betsy Johnson. And Betsy, you're on mute. Oh, they reminded me not to mute myself. Anyway, okay, I just have to say thank you, Eric, so much. I just have to say thank you so much, Dr. Danielson. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Fawn. Thank you so much to the um, students from Youth and Focus. I am just awed and humbled. And I am, and just your words have given me so many places to think. And I'm looking forward to the discussion we're going to have in the breakout rooms. I'm excited about the possibilities that we have in front of us. Um, I agree with you, Dr. Danielson, that we cannot just make inter incremental change, that it is time for logarithmic change in education and really bringing true racial equity to our school systems. I am also awed and inspired and reminded of why I've been watching the comments go by and as people introduce themselves about just the breadth of people who are invested in our students in Washington State and how many roles they have from teachers to counselors to principals to leaders in school districts to people who are doing policy to legislators. It just the um, you know the depth of that environment and the people who are involved. I want to you know thank and honor you as well because I'm you know sort of truly inspired by you coming and the work that you're doing um, and that we really need to address um, racial equity in education and that's something that the League of Education Voters is centering its work around. Um, in the last six months, I hope you've been able to join us, but we've hosted a number of webinars on this topic from superintendents, educators, and other thought leaders who are doing you know, real work in this area and for our students. Um, it's why our staff has been working with partner organizations on crafting new policies, developing research, and creating coalitions around the state. And it's why we want to reach out whenever we can to partner with organizations that are doing this work um, in the community. So we will continue to lead when it's appropriate and provide allyship, partner when we can, and support others from behind the scenes when it's right. Um, but to do that, we and to put on events like today, it does take a lot of work. And I would like to invest invite you to invest with us in this work. You know, we appreciate anything that you can give and it will allow us to do more of this kind of work. So when this event is over, uh, please join us at our website, educationvoters.org. And if you can make a donation, we would really appreciate that. And I think Eric's gonna drop a link in the chat. So thank you again. Again, I am just awed and inspired and I hope uh, to see you and work with you again as we move forward in improving racial education in our school systems. So now Eric is gonna explain our breakout room so we can have a chance to talk to others about racial equity in education. Thank you so much, Betsy. 
Also, I wanted to mention that anyone who donates to League of Education Voters Foundation in the next 24 hours will be entered in a random drawing. You'll get to travel anywhere Alaska Airlines flies in the next year, and hopefully COVID will settle down by then. Just give in the next 24 hours, and you'll be entered in the drawing to win two tickets on Alaska Airlines. Just go to our website to donate. That's educationvoters.org slash donate, which I put in the chat, and support our organization's work. We'll do a random drawing in about 24 hours to give the tickets away. Now, it is time to reflect on what you've heard from Dr. Ben and Brooke Brown. This is a place for everyone. We wanna hear everyone's voices. I'd like to welcome people of all genders, people of African descent, Black, African-American, Asian descent, Arab descent, Middle Eastern descent, European descent, those who identify as Hispanic, Latinx, people indigenous to this land, and people of mixed, multiple descents, both people with and without documentation. Languages spoken here, Spanish, English, Russian, Vietnamese, Somali, Arabic, indigenous languages, sign language, etc. People of different class backgrounds, people who currently struggle with getting access to the resources necessary for survival, and people who currently have more access to those resources. People with disabilities, visible or invisible. Your bodies and the different ways you experience yours. Survivors. People who identify as activists and people who don't. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, heterosexual, pansexual, queer or others for whom none of the labels fit. People who are single, married, partnered, dating, in monogamous or polyamorous relationships those who are sexually active and those who aren't, people with different faiths, religious traditions, faith practices, private practices not belonging to a tradition, agnostics, atheists, seekers, those in their teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Your emotions, joy and bliss, grief, rage, indignation, contentment, disappointment. Those who support you to be here. Your families, genetic and otherwise. Those dear to us who have died. Our elders, those here in this room, in our lives, and those who have passed away. Welcome. Dr. Danielson gave us three questions to get our breakout room started. They are, what makes this time different? What would it look like to raise our game? And what does real reckoning as a nation look like? What we're gonna do in a few minutes, and I, I sent you a link in a reminder email to a breakout room, and they're uh, broken down by the first letter of your last name. And we'll be putting those links in the chat in case you didn't receive those. So uh, Raymond, who's helping me out, uh, Raymond, if you could uh, send out those links to all panelists and attendees, that way uh, you'll have that link to go to the breakout rooms. We have a couple of norms that we'll want to put out so that we're all on the same page. The first one is, please introduce yourself with your name, personal pronouns if you'd like, state your racial identity if you feel comfortable, and share what brings you to this space. Honor confidentiality. Lessons learned can leave the space, but the stories are confidential. Use I statements. Push yourself into discomfort and welcome the discomfort. Acknowledge impact, regardless of intent. And step up and step back. That means if you're used to speaking in group settings, pull back a little bit. And if normally you don't speak as much, feel free to step up if you feel comfortable. In the chat function, you'll see that Zoom link to the three meetings that are organized by the first letter of your last name. If you've already registered for your meeting, thank you. And it's not too late if you haven't. Just paste the link that corresponds to the first letter in your last name into your browser and you'll be all set. I'll be hosting the A through F group. League of Education Voters CEO Lori Hennessy will host G through O. And Eric Holzapfel, the Director of Field and Community Engagement, will host letters P through Z. We'll give you a couple of minutes to log on and we'll start as close as we can to say 1237. How's that? All right. We look forward to seeing you in the breakout meetings.
And uh, we'll see you in a moment. Thank you again for joining us today and watch for the follow-up email coming to your inbox in about 24 hours that'll have a link to the recording and a link to Dr. Danielson's slides, among other things.